Well, let me welcome you into the second week of a summer-long series where, as you are aware, I hope, we are studying together verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. We're calling this, We Are One, Together As One, or Together We Are One. And last Sunday, we began just by way of introduction by emphasizing the necessity of congregational unity to the accomplishing of the great vision that God has given us. And that word, necessity, is an important word. It's not an option or it's not that it's just preferable that we would be unified. No, it is necessary that we are congregationally, as a body, we are unified if we are to accomplish the vision that God has called us to. You remember last week we recited out loud our church vision statement, which says, I won't ask you to say it today, but it says, we believe that Jesus came to build a church that would overpower the forces of hell and enlarge the kingdom of God. We envision being that church. We understand that because Jesus has come and filled us following his death and resurrection and ascension, he has filled the church and left us here Here's what's supposed to happen. Hell's supposed to get smaller. Heaven's supposed to get bigger. The kingdom of God is supposed to go forth and the kingdom of darkness is supposed to retreat. And we want to be the church that accomplishes that great vision. And in order for that to happen, it is absolutely necessary that we operate, that we function in love for one another and for the Lord and that we walk in unity. Here was the principle that we learned last week. Without biblical oneness, no church can accomplish very much of God's vision. Without biblical oneness, we can never move ahead in what God wants us to do. Now, the second thing that we learned last week, just laying the foundation, is that the source of this required unity is Jesus himself. The source, the reason we have unity is because we have all been called together in Jesus. Without Jesus, we might not have much in agreement. We, we might not have much to put our hands to together. W- listen, some of us may not even like one another, right? I mean, without Jesus, we would be all separate. But we have been brought together in him. He is the source of our unity. In fact, the principle that we established last Sunday, and we'll talk about this all the way through this summer, is that we are one simply because Jesus has made us one. It is his divine unity, his work. We're not one because we strategically plan to be one. We're not one because somehow we make it happen. No, no. We are one in Jesus. He is the source of our unity. Now, that was the first 12 verses of chapter 1 that got us going last week. Today, we're going to pick the text up in verse number 12 and read down through the end of the chapter. So, you do mind to follow along with me as I read. If you don't have a Bible with you, I hope you'll look on with your neighbor and, uh, and then bring a Bible with you. When you come next week, we're students of the Scripture. We love to have our Bibles, to mark in our Bibles, underline things, study the Bible together. And so, I hope you'll bring a copy with you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 says... That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Real quickly, what is the purchased possession that will ultimately, finally, and fully be redeemed? Well, it really is all of creation that Christ is redeeming, all that has fallen and been lost in the fall. But specifically, he's talking about the church, those of us who know Jesus as our Savior, until that moment when we were with him fully in his presence, this redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, I also, Paul writes in verse 15, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's what I'm praying, verse 17. I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of himself. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, 
that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ or was working in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that world which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet and has made him or given to him to Christ to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And all God's people on every campus said, Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to begin with me today by jotting down somewhere in your notes what Paul is describing for us or discussing with us here, which is the way of salvation. Would you get that jotted down somewhere? He's talking to us about the way of salvation. And in fact, Paul has been since the very introductory words of this letter, really from all the way up in verse number one, he has been talking about the way in which God has been good to us in the gift of salvation. He's been declaring God's goodness in the gift of of salvation. He says that we have been blessed. Now let me take a, a quick survey across campuses. If you believe that in the gift of Jesus and in the gift of salvation, we are blessed, would you shout amen? amen. I, I know you believe that. What a blessing it is for us to belong to Jesus. This is what Paul is saying over and over. Look at verse number three, chapter one, verse three. He says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Well, what a blessing to be blessed with all spiritual blessings. Do you agree? In fact, would, on all campuses, would you say this out loud with me? What a blessing. If you think it's a blessing to be blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, would you say, what a blessing? Let's say it. What a blessing, what a blessing that is. Well, look at verse number uh, four. He goes on. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Well, he has, he, before he made worlds, he knew us, loved us, and chose us in himself. Would you say that loud with me? What a blessing. Look at verse number five. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children. He has adopted us into his family. Well, what a blessing. Look at verse number six. To the praise of his glory of his grace, wherein we are made accepted in the beloved. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. We have been chosen in him. We have been adopted into his family. He has made us accepted in his presence. Say it with me. What a blessing. And then look at verse number seven. In whom, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Not only has he blessed us with all spiritual blessings, he chose us in himself, he adopted us in his family, he made us accepted in his presence, but we came to him with all of our sin and guilt and shame. He forgave it, he released us from the prison and the power of sin, and he washed it all away by his grace. Well, amen, what a blessing that is. Do you see that Paul is over and over saying, we are so blessed by this goodness of God. And then in verse number seven, he emphasizes the fact that these blessings that have come to us are ours through the grace of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. He says that we should always remember that all of the blessings that are ours, I am adopted in God's family, I am accepted in God's presence, my sins have been forgiven, I am blessed in the heavenlies. All of these things have come to me, not because we're good, not because we've been baptized, not because we went to church on Sunday morning, not because we're better than some. 
Every blessing that we have has come because God sent his son in grace. His son shed his blood for our sins, and we now have been accepted in Jesus Christ. What a blessing that is. This is Paul's emphasis that we should know that this salvation has come to us through the grace of God. And by the way, this has been Paul's message all along. His message never changed. He always, in each of his letters, emphasized the fact that every blessing that we have has come to us through Christ. In fact, Acts chapter number 18 describes his arrival in Ephesus. And it tells us how that he founded, he established the church in Ephesus. And in Acts 18, he's preaching the same message. It is the message of salvation by grace through faith. In Jesus, it never changed. And, and it would be my prayer in my life and in yours that this, that this consistency of conviction would be ours as well. That our motto would never change. That we would say today, and if you come and see me on my deathbed at a ripe old age of 100 years old if I live that long, that on that day as I draw my last breath, I will still be saying, by the grace of God, through the blood of Jesus, everything that I have has come to me because of his mercy and his grace. Let that conviction never waver in your life. Paul says in verses 12 and 13 that this blessing has come, this salvation has come. Verse 12, he said, it came to me first, and now I have passed it along to you. And he begins in these verses to lay out the, the process, if you will, of the way of salvation. Write these things down. What is the way or the process or the pathway of salvation? Paul tells us, first of all, that you hear the gospel. This is very obvious, but we need to understand it. The way of salvation begins with hearing the gospel. Look at verse 13. In whom also you trusted after, you trusted after what came before the trusting was the hearing after that you heard of the, the word of truth, the gospel or the good news of your salvation. Listen to me. Salvation begins with the ears. It begins with hearing the gospel. Now, maybe you observe it in someone's life. You observe a testimony with your eyes. But before someone can trust in Jesus, they must hear about Jesus. All campuses, if you're listening, shout amen. amen. Don't miss this. Before a person can believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, they have to hear about Jesus. No person is a believer until they believe. Every person is an unbeliever until they believe. And no one believes until they hear. Paul says, you heard it first. Go back, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. It's just a few pages back in your Bible. Look at Romans chapter 10. I want you to look at verse number 14. Most of us are familiar with verse number 13. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I've never led anybody to personal saving faith in Jesus that at the end of that conversation, I didn't take them to Romans 10, 13 and affirm their salvation. I told you last week about a sweet lady named Mary Ann that Tracy and I met about a week and a half ago, and, and we were able to lead her to faith in Jesus. And after she prayed to, her, to give her life to Christ, I took her to Romans 10, 13. And I said to her, Mary Ann, Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And whosoever means anybody. So Mary Ann, we could take the word whosoever out and we could insert the name Mary Ann. And Romans 10, 13 says, for if Mary Ann shall call upon the name of Jesus or call upon the name of the Lord, Mary Ann shall be saved. I said, Mary Ann, what did you just do? And she said, I just called upon the Lord. And I said, so Mary Ann, you are what? And she said, well, I'm saved. And I said, amen, that's right. You are saved. She was saved because she called, but you have to hear to call. Look at the next verse, verse 14. Verse 14 says, Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? You have to hear before you can believe. You have to believe before you can trust and call. And he goes on in verse number 14 to say, and how shall they hear 
without a preacher, without someone to tell them. So think about it. We all know people. We all live around people. We all work with people. We all, we, we all have relationships. We know people who don't know Jesus, and we would love for them to be born again. But let me ask you, how are they going to be born again? How are they going to trust in Jesus if they don't hear of him? And how are they going to hear of him if you don't tell them? Do you understand? Paul says this is the way of salvation. We get it first, and then we give it away to other people so that they can hear the good news. It's a really wonderful time for me to stop and promote the fact that coming up in just a couple of weeks, July the 14th, we have our summer semester of evangelism training happening on all of our campuses. And so you can, you can spend some weeks learning how to be the one through whom they will hear. If you don't know how to share the gospel, go to the website, go to the information desk, sign up for that class. Because how shall they call on whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear unless we tell them? Paul says the way of salvation, back in Ephesians chapter 1, the way of salvation begins with hearing the gospel. Then in verse number 13, chapter 1 verse 13, he goes on to say, once you've heard the gospel, then you believe the gospel and you trust in Jesus. This is verse 13. In whom also, after you heard, you trust. After you hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The way of salvation begins with the ears It begins with the head, and then it moves to the heart. We hear the gospel, we understand it, and then we trust it. It moves from here to here. Now, let me tell you what's, I'm certain this is true, that there are some people under the sound of my voice in this room in Weaverville, probably in both of our campuses, east and west, certainly watching online. There are people who are under the sound of my voice right now, you have heard of Jesus, Maybe your whole life you've heard of Jesus. You know what's true about Jesus. You you understand it in your head. But it has never moved from here to here. You have never called upon him in repentance and faith and trusted in him as your Savior. Paul says the hearing is first, but then you've got to move to the second step. And that is to trust and believe. The third step in the way of salvation, or at that moment of conversion, is you are then sealed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 goes on to say, in whom, after you believed in Jesus, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The word sealed is this this moment of indwelling. When the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, it means to be marked by the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we hear the gospel, we, be, we, we understand it, then we believe it and we trust in Jesus. In that moment, the Holy Spirit marks our lives, in, uh, indwells us, and fills us. And in doing so, verse 14 says, that we are then secured for eternal life. So you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, and trust in Jesus, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and you are secured for eternal life. Verse 14, the Holy Spirit is the earnest or the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The Holy Spirit guarantees our ultimate part in the eternal kingdom of God, that we will live forever with him. The guarantee of that is that the Holy Spirit is in my life. Listen to me, all all of you. If I were to say to you right now, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? And you were to say to me, yes. And I were to say to you, how do you know it? What would you say? What's the evidence that you are saved? If you said, well, I prayed a prayer when I was 12, is that evidence of salvation? It may, be the, it may be the moment you came to Christ, but is it any evidence today, 10 years, 20 years later, 40 years later? Is it any evidence of your salvation? No. Well, I got baptized when I was 15. Wonderful, that's a great thing. But is it evidence of your salvation? No. The only genuine evidence of of conversion is that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans, if you have the Holy Spirit, you're his. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not his. It is that plain, plainly spoken in the book of Romans. The way that you know for sure that you're saved is there is evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life. If the Holy Spirit is present, 
then you have in fact been born again. This is the way of salvation. We hear it. We believe it. We trust in Jesus. The Holy Spirit indwells us and the Holy Spirit guarantees us eternal life. That's the way of salvation. Now, Notice with me in verse number 14, we read this phrase, to the praise of his glory. You see at the end of the verse? To the praise of his glory. Do you know that you see this exact phrase, or almost the exact same phrase, in three verses in chapter 1. Verse number 6 says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Verse number 12 says that we should be to the praise of his glory. And then verse number 14 says, unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. What does that mean? The praise of his glory. What is what it means? It means that having heard the gospel, having believed the gospel and trusted in Jesus, having been filled with the Holy Spirit and sealed, guaranteed for eternal life, the Holy Spirit now working in my life, our transformed lives should be lending approval to the grace of God. In other words, the word to the praise means applauding. That the the work of God transforming our lives should be applauding the grace of Almighty God. Listen, not bringing into question the grace of Almighty God. I love you, but I'm going to tell you something that is so often, far too many times is this true in the life of people who claim to know Christ. Someone claims to know Jesus as their Savior. Maybe they truly are converted, but their life is so pulled toward the world. They're so in love with the world. And they live with a philosophy that says, well, Jesus is graceful, I'm under grace, I'm forgiven, and it's all going to work out okay. And we are living under grace, and God is merciful, and he will and does forgive us. But loved ones, here's what Paul is teaching. If you have been brought along in this way of salvation, and the Holy Spirit lives within you, your life, the transformation of our lives should not bring his grace into question. The transformation of our lives should bring his grace into highlight. It should be applauding his grace. Here's the way I would say it to you. People stand on the beach and they look at the vastness of the ocean and they say, there must be a God. Or people look up at the stars at night and they see the vastness of the galaxies and they say, there must be a God that would create all of this. And he's powerful. And he's good. People stand in these mountains and they look at the beauty of God's creation and and they, they exclaim, there must be a God. People watch a sunrise. They say, it's glorious. There must be a God. Well, can I tell you that more than sunrises and sunsets and beach expansions and galaxies and universes and more than the stars in the sky, what people should be able to do is to look at the transformation in our lives and say, there must be a God. And he's good. You should have seen that guy five years ago. You should have seen that gal a year ago. They are so different, so transformed by the grace of God. I know God is real because their life is to the praise of his glory. So so may we make that commitment today. God, would, would you allow me to be so surrendered to you that my life would be so transformed by you? That nobody needs a sunset, nobody needs a a sunrise, nobody needs an ocean view or or a mountain view to know that you're real. All they have to do is look at what you're doing in me. Paul says that all of the things that God, all of the blessings that God has given us in our salvation is to the praise of his glory. So this is the way of salvation that Paul is teaching us about. Now, because God has been working salvation in these people in the Ephesian church, Paul loves them and he is, he is interested in, he's concerned for their unity. I want you to jot this down. Not only does he remind them of the way of salvation, but you see in verses 15 and 16, Paul's heart for unity in the church. L- listen to verses 15 and 16. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you, in my prayers. What you learn in these verses is that for Paul, 
And for all of us, we should know that the key to unity is a genuine love for others and a focus on others. If you want to mess up any relationship, listen carefully. If you want to mess up a marriage, you want to mess up a friendship, you want to mess up a church friendship, or, a, or you, want to, you want to mess up a church relationship, you want to mess up your serve team or your life group or mess up a work relationship, here's all you need to do. Just make everything about you. Just be so prideful, so self-centered, so demanding that you'll just destroy those relationships. The key to unity is you matter more than I do. The key to unity is what Paul says in another place when he says, let each of you esteem others higher than himself. You see this in Paul's words. He says in verse number 15, I praise God for you, your faith. I'm grateful for your love. I see how you love other people. They were demonstrating it as well. They were loving others. I thank God for your love for the saints. I thank God for your faith. I thank God for you. And I pray for you. Hear me. That when we are grateful for others and we celebrate what God is doing in them, maybe it's not all it could or should be, but it is something And when we are grateful for them and we celebrate God's grace and his work in them rather than complaining about them or criticizing them, when we love others and we pray for them with gratitude, then we are pursuing unity and we will realize it. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this challenge on all of our campuses. I want you to write this down. They're going to put it up on the screen for us. Would you make this a commitment this week? Before I criticize blank, whoever that is, you fill in the blank. Before I criticize so-and-so, I will pray for them with gratitude. Now you, you fill in the blank. Maybe it's your, your spouse you fill in the book. Let me tell you who you should put in there. Before I criticize my pastor, that's the one you should have put in there. <laughs> now you fill in the blank, whoever it is. But before I criticize whomever, I will pray for them with gratitude. <laughs> this was happening. Tracy and I were having a conversation a week or so ago. And I was just kind of on a rant. I was frustrated about, about a particular uh, person. And I was just sort of, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was just not kind of on a rant to Tracy. And I got about halfway through, through my rant, or what I thought would have been halfway through, because I had plenty more. And she didn't say a word. She was probably praying the Holy Spirit would shut my mouth. But she didn't say anything. But about halfway through, I just stopped and said, you know what? I ought to shut up. Because I haven't prayed a moment about anything that I'm saying. When we pursue or or when we pray for people with gratitude and we celebrate what God is doing in them rather than being critical, then we're pursuing unity. And we'll experience that unity. So we ought to do this. And so we ought, to, we ought to pray for one another because Paul would teach us in Ephesians 1 that there is a better way for us to pray than the way that we typically do. You know, we typically pray in a couple of lanes, right? We, usually the way we pray for people is this. Either we pray kind of shallow, vanilla prayers that are just kind of based, you know, they're, they're praying for kind of temporal needs or, or wants. And there's nothing wrong with praying for those things. But it, it's not wrong. It's just not rich, Right? So we, we either pray that way or we pray lights and sirens. It's a crisis and, and we're just, you know, crying out. Wouldn't it be better if we prayed more deep and rich prayers? Paul shows us how to do it. Let me give them to you quickly. All campuses are on down. Number one, Paul shows us that we should pray for our loved ones, our friends, our church family to have rich spiritual insight. Rich spiritual insight. Verses 7 and 8. I'm sorry, 17 and 18. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of himself so that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. I want you to have wisdom and understanding and that the eyes of your heart would be opened up and enlightened. Now Paul's praying for Christians. These are the Ephesian believers. Chapter 1, verse 1. These are saints. These are believers in Jesus. Why would Paul need to pray for Christians to have a shift in the way that they are thinking? Here's why. Listen carefully. 
Because our salvation is an ongoing process. When we trust in Jesus and believe the gospel, we're converted immediately. We are born again immediately. Our sins are forgiven immediately. But the way that we think is an ongoing transformation. There are a lot of people who are born again who still think like unsaved people. Who still build marriages like unsaved couples. Who still parent kids like unsaved parents. Who still have a level of integrity that matches unsaved people because our thinking hasn't been surrendered to changing. So Paul says, I'm praying for you that you will begin, there'll be a shift in the way that you think. You need to think spiritually, align your thoughts with the spirit. Paul dealt with this in 1 Corinthians chapter number two. In fact, turn there quickly and I've got a, I've got a hustle. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter two and listen to what Paul says in verse number one. He reminds them in the first few verses that when he came to them, he didn't come with intellectual arguments or great swelling oratory and, uh, and great speeches. Look at verse one. He said, when I came into Corinth to, to share the gospel with you, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul said, when I came to you, I didn't speak with human wisdom. I didn't speak like the world thinks. I just gave you spiritual truth. And then he says in verse number six, that's what I'm still doing. Howbeit we speak wisdom now among them that are mature. We're not speaking according to the world Uh, nor of the princes of this world that will come to nothing. Verse seven, but we are speaking the wisdom of God. We're speaking the wisdom of God. And if you go down to verse number 14, he says, but the natural man does not receive the things of God, uh, the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Look at chapter three, verse one. And you, brethren, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual but it's carnal. Here's what Paul says the problem in the Corinthian church was. That though they had been born again, they were still thinking like the world thinks. And so Paul teaches us in many of his writings that our minds need to be changed. Uh, Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, let this mind or attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Christ. Jesus. Paul says that we need to change the way that we think. And when we think like the world thinks, then we will always struggle and we will always be divided. Listen to what James said in James chapter 4 verse 1. He says, what causes conflicts and quarrels among you? What divides you? Don't these quarrels and conflicts come from your passions within you? The carnal way of thinking within you, your lusts, that divides us. So Paul teaches us that we should pray that one, for one another, for our spouses, for one another, that we would have deep spiritual insight, that we would think very biblically, very spiritually. Now, the second thing that he prays for them is that they would then um, uh, have deep spiritual knowledge. And you see this in verse number 18, that they would know some things, that they would know the hope of his calling. And that they would know the, rich, the, the glory of the riches of his inheritance in the saints. No time to unpack those this morning. But he's praying that they will know and understand those things. And then thirdly, he prays for them beginning in verse 19 that they would have great spiritual power. They would know the power of God that's available to them. You know, ancient Ephesus would be a bit like um, modern New York City or modern Miami. A very um, ungodly um, a secular um, uh, city full of people who reject Christ and care nothing for the righteousness, the morality, the ways, the word of God. Um, It was a place where there was a lot of affluence and a lot of intellect and a lot of uh, intellectualism and a lot of power. And it would be very easy for those first Christians in Ephesus to be intimidated by that. And he says to them, beginning in verse 19, don't be intimidated. I want you to know the power of God that's available to you. It's the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, seated him in heaven, exalted him above all powers and dominions of all time, empowered him over the enemy, and made him the head of the church. 
This is the power that's available to us. Paul said, I want you to pray for one another that there'll be deep, uh, uh, rich insight, deep knowledge, and that you'll understand the power of God. Now, I'm out of time, but there's one last thing I got to show you just to close in these last two verses of chapter 1. I want you to see it. Listen to what Paul says in verse 22 and 23. He says, he has put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church. Verse 23, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Man, what, a, what a, an astounding verse. That the church is the fullness of him who fills all things all in all. Would you jot it down this way on all of our campuses just to close? Paul tells us that Christ is filling all things. Christ is filling all things with his wisdom, his glory, and his power. And he's doing that through the church. Here's what I would suggest to you. When Paul says that, the, that Christ fills all things all in all, he's saying that Christ is filling all of creation. And it is becoming more and more known as the church goes forth and heaven is enlarged and hell is diminished that more and more, in more and more places, in more and more corners, in all of creation, Christ is filling all things. And when he comes in that day, which verse number um, 14 describes as the redemption of the purchased possession, when he comes again and brings all things together in Christ, as verse number 10 says, in that day, he will finally and fully and eternally fill all things. And what will that look like? Well, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 2 that it'll look like this. In that day, the whole earth will shine reflecting his glory. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14 that in that day, when the when the fullness of redemption has come and Christ is filling all things all in all, that in that day, and understand, he fills all things now, but when all of creation realizes and understands and embraces it, that in that day, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. What a day that will be. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 12 that in that day when he fills all things all with all in all that the trees of the field will clap their hands for him. And the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 22 that in that day every nation will worship Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. He is filling all things all in all. And today, until that day comes, he has been made to be the head of the church, which being filled with him is the fullness of him that fills all things. Now that glory of Jesus is going forth through and by the church. And so as we live with greater insight, greater knowledge, greater power, loving and praying for each other and praying for unity and blessing this world through the unity that God gives us, then his word or his glory goes forth in this world. May God help us to be the church that Jesus came to build, one in him.